Okay, on to the next genetic technology that we have to talk about for this chapter. We are going to be covering something known as gel electrophoresis. Now, this particular technology is just a method of separating either DNA molecules or protein molecules depending on their charge and mass. We are not separating both of them at the same time, by the way. It's either there are two types of electrophoresis. Protein electrophoresis, where we separate proteins, or DNA electrophoresis, where it's separating DNA molecules only. And the separation is based on their charge and mass of the molecules. And the pictures that I'm including down here um, are through DNA electrophoresis. When you separate the DNA molecules according to their charge and mass, they will produce those patterns. And those patterns are referred to as DNA fingerprints. So the focus on this chapter, however, is going to be on DNA electrophoresis only. The first thing that we have to understand here for DNA electrophoresis, as mentioned, is separating DNA fragments based on their charge and mass to produce banding patterns or DNA fingerprints. And just to reiterate my point, these are examples of the banding patterns. Now, why would we actually do DNA electrophoresis? Number one, we can use it for forensics. When we talk about forensics, we are talking more on the crime scene. I'm sure you guys have watched like some crime shows or some crime drama and they will tell the person or the suspect, we found your DNA in the crime scene. How did they exactly find the DNA in the crime scene? That's what they're talking about, the DNA fingerprints. We also use DNA electrophoresis on paternity testings when we want to confirm whether the child belongs to actually came from the father's DNA or did not come from the father's DNA. Uh, that's more on the family side of things. And also we can use it for genetic screening because we can use DNA electrophoresis to detect specific alleles in the person. I will show you how DNA electrophoresis is used in genetic screening at the last part of this video later. So just hang on. Now, for DNA electrophoresis to happen, there are a few requirements. Number one, we need the DNA fragments, obviously, to get separated. Uh, and for my example here, please do not memorize my example, but I'm showing you four DNA fragments. Now, some students will say, where did these fragments come from? Don't worry about that part. Let's just focus on the fact that we have some DNA fragments right now. So these DNA fragments, I want you to notice that fragment A is the longest, fragment B is slightly shorter, C is much shorter, D is the shortest DNA fragment or the smallest DNA fragment, okay? The point is, I just want you to understand that these fragments have different length and mass. The longer it is, the higher the mass, the shorter it is, the smaller the mass. The next thing that we also need is, we also need something known as polyacrylamide gel. You don't have to memorize that name. You can just say that we need a gel. Now, the polyacrylamide gel is a very interesting gel that is able to separate DNA molecules according to their mass. I will explain that later. And the last thing that DNA electrophoresis will always need is the electrical field. You need to apply an electrical field of cathode, a negative point, and a naught positive end. Um, it's good to memorize that cathode is negative and anode is positive, but in the exam, if you just say that DNA electrophoresis needs a negative end and a positive end, that's good enough. I always get those two confused. I always think that cathodes are positive and anodes are negative. I think the reason is because of chemistry, because cations are positive ions, anions are negative ions. So I get, you know, sometimes even my brain, you know, has that, the wires cross in my brain sometimes and it short circuits. So just mentioning a negative N and positive N is good enough. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw out the a container, a three-dimensional container, and it's filled with the polyacrylamide gel. But what I'm also going to do here is I'm going to show you the top view. So the top view is we are just looking at how the gel is supposed to look like. We will then apply the negative field and the positive field. Okay, that, that's done by using specific uh, electrical components. We don't have to go into the detail of that. But you can see that the cathode is at the, you know, this end 
end and the A node is on the other end. And at the negative end or the cathode end, we also dig up a well. A well just means that we kind of remove a little bit of the gel and at that area, we apply the DNA fragments. Now, if you notice, it's there are many DNA fragments over there. There's a lot of DNA fragments A, there's a lot of DNA fragments B, and a lot of DNA fragments C, and a lot of DNA fragments D. So how did we manage to get copies of A, B, C, and D? Obviously, we managed to get copies of A, B, C, and D using something known as polymerase chain reaction. Now, there is a reason why you need to have multiple copies of A, multiple copies of B, multiple copies of C, and also multiple copies of D. The reason is because if you have only one molecule of A, B, C, and D, the results will not be so clear. So to make the results more clearer, to produce those thick fingerprint bands that I'm talking about, you need to have multiple copies of each DNA fragments. How do we produce multiple copies of each DNA fragments? Just run it through polymerase chain reaction. Now, what I want you to understand here is the DNA molecules are all kind of collected in the well. They're not separated yet, by the way. And we will put the DNA at the negative end. Now, why do we put the DNA on the cathode or the negative end of the apparatus, this gel electrophoresis setup? The reason is because DNA is inherently negatively charged. If you remember in the DNA molecule, which are made up of DNA nucleotides, they have the phosphate groups, which I've highlighted over there in yellow. The phosphate groups are ions which are negatively charged. So DNA is inherently negative, okay? So when you put them at the negative end and you basically put the positive end on the other side, what will actually happen is it forces the DNA to move to the positive end because DNA, which is negatively charged, will be attracted to the positive end end of the gel. So negative molecules are attracted to the positive side. That's the logic of it. Now, the thing over here is by putting it in something known as the polyacrylamide gel, it will provide resistance. Resistance just means that, okay, imagine if you were in a, you were just walking uh, like normally and you have no problems walking from one point to another point but imagine walking in a pool of water you're in a swimming pool and you're trying to walk from point a to point b you will have more resistance the same principle applies here the gel that polyacrylamide gel will provide resistance and it makes it so that the smaller fragments will travel much further than the larger fragments so as you can see here yes all the fragments are negatively charged and they'll all move to the positive side, the A node end. However, molecule D has the least resistance because it can wiggle through the space within the gel and move the furthest. However, at that same period of time, molecule A, which is the largest, will move the least because it has the largest mass and it's the longest. It will have the most difficulty moving through the gel. Some students will argue that Molecule A should have more negative charge, so it should move further, and molecule D has less negative charge, so it should move lesser because it has less phosphate groups. The problem here is the mass supersedes the charge. So the mass of the molecule influences whether it moves further or not, by the way. So at this point over here, what exactly happens? After a certain period of time, you will notice that it will produce four bands. Now, what exactly are these four bands all about? And this is the DNA fingerprint right here. So, it will produce these four bands, and those four bands will correspond to A, B, C, and D. A traveled the least because it is the largest DNA fragment. D traveled the most because it had the shortest DNA fragments. Remember, if you only had one copy of A, one copy of B, one copy of C and D, you will not be able to see those fragments clearly. So you need to have multiple copies of them. That's how they produce these DNA fragments. Now, as an example, let's see how we can use gel electrophoresis 
to screen or to detect a genetic disease. Now, as an example, do not need to memorize this, but a gene for the genetic disease has the large B allele, which is normal, and the small B allele, which uh, causes the disease to happen. So, and I'm just going to draw out the DNA fragments, the chromosome. The large B allele has that length, the small B allele has that length. But interestingly, if we use a restriction enzyme to cut the large B allele, it cannot be cut. The reason is probably because there is no restriction sites or no areas where the enzyme can cut the large B allele. But it so happens coincidentally, the small B allele, because the B sequence is slightly different, it can be cut using the restriction endonuclease and it will be cut into two fragments. As you can see there, it's cut into one large-ish fragment and one small fragment right there. Now, three people go to the hospital and there are the three people's names are as follows, Methuselah, Lamia, and Barrett. Don't <laughs> the names just came randomly. Okay, it's uh, Lamia and Barrett, if you play Persona 5, uh, you would know that these are just some of the personas. Anyway, so these people went to the hospital to check whether they have the disease. So what the scientists did were, they actually checked the DNA and they put the DNA into the gel and separated it according to DNA fragments. Interestingly for Methuselah, they only had one band forming. For Lamia, they had two bands forming at the bottom. And for Barrett, they had three DNA fragments forming. So what does that tell us? The one closest to the well is the largest fragment, medium, and then smallest fragment. So what are the genotypes of Methuselah, Lamia, and Barrett? In this case over here, we know for the fact that Methuselah has to be large B, large B. How do we know they only have the large B, large B allele? Because they only have that allele right there. That allele could not be cut. So that allele will get separated and it's the largest. It will get separated over that. So they only have large B, large B allele. Simple as that. Lamia, however, will probably be small B, small B because fragment because they have the small b allele, the allele could be cut into two fragments, where fragment number two will get separated over there. Fragment number three, which is the smallest, will get separated the furthest. That's what happens. What about Barrett? I'm just going to give you about 10 seconds to try to figure Barrett out. If you guessed that Barrett is large b, small b, you are right, because they had the large B allele which is separated over there and they have the small B alleles which are separated there and also there. There you go. So that is how we can use gel electrophoresis to detect the presence of specific diseases or even predict the genotype of a person. So I hope you understand this one.